Greetings, everybody. This video is prompted by a recent debate that I saw between David Smith and Ben Burgess, who is a logic professor at Rutgers and a democratic socialist. And the debate was about whether or not uh, taxation is theft. And there's a lot in that debate. I'll put a link in the description uh, that could be talked about. And I don't want to talk about everything. I just want to address uh, one of the main points. Uh, Dave Smith was uh, basically alleging that we, you know, there's self-ownership and that property rights derive from self-ownership. And that logic is what eventually leads you to conclusions like having theft and the taxation is theft. And Burgess, uh, on the one hand, his arguments would be dependent on the ass assertion of a collective or a state ownership of not only people, but all property. And although I think that there are some uh, metaphysical difficulties or deontological difficulties with asserting private property rights um, or even just rights period um, w especially w with individuals there are several more layers of assertions and abstractions to arrive at collective ownership or state ownership um, so it is it's a it's a taller order so to speak uh, to assert that but before going into whether or not the states or collectives or whatever have rights he just kind of raised an issue that, well, uh, private private or ownership of self ownership is is, is questionable because uh, of things something like slavery. Dave Smith, well, slavery is not about self ownership. Sla slavery involves the coercion of an individual by somebody else, uh, usually a state or at least another society. At least historically speaking, uh, slavery existed in prehistoric times, but even then, it would be reliant on on, on coercion. Uh, and that's not, uh, libertarians are not advocating that. People who believe in self-ownership, they actually object to slavery because it violates self-ownership. So Burgess kind of retreated to the next worst thing that he could think about arising in this there in a private property scenario, and that would be indentured servitude. So he didn't really articulate it, but the, I guess the idea here is uh, if we can um, create a hypothetical worst case scenario for a given principle, then that principle is therefore invalid. And I think that uh, this line of logic is something that you could basically invalidate anything. Uh, and I mean, if, if we're going to say, well, that's the worst thing that can happen with self-ownership, then that's really not that bad. And I'll go into, I'll, I'll qualify that a little bit more. Uh, in a little bit here, but if we're talking about what's the worst thing that can happen from taxation, it's a lot worse than that because taxation is what makes war possible. Taxation is what makes police states possible. Taxation is what makes every humanitarian outrage, crime, uh, you know, uh, that, that the government do, does possible. In addition to its own, the, the fact that taxation is itself morally questionable, you know, is itself outrageous. I mean, this, if, 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 so there's that problem with it. Um, the other problem is that it seems like there's a characterization of indentured servitude that's not entirely fair. Um, if you are in desperate need of something and somebody offers you a way out, offers you a lot of money, they are not morally responsible for you being in desperate straits, unless they are. I mean, there might be situations where they are in some way. But this is the the, the big problem uh, the, that uh, people on the left, especially socialists, have, is that they look at somebody who is in some kind of dilemma, and they might it might be a dilemma of their own making or that's not of their making, either one, uh, and then they cooperate with a third party who is not responsible for their circumstances, who is not guilty of putting them in the position that they are in. Uh, and then they will argue somehow that that third party is is wrong or evil or bad because they have the other person's desperation is drawing them to them. Okay, well, everyone would like it if nobody was ever desperate and that there was never any kind of need and that nobody had to worry about anything and that there was no stress and that there was no such thing as risk and blah 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 we can all we can all say that that would all be great if we had those things but we don't have those things and we can never have those things 
And how we deal with them is important, but you definitely can't start from the premise that people who are not responsible should be considered uh, morally suspect or morally guilty or criminal even uh, because they offer a potential escape, right? If somebody is starving because uh, of some natural disaster, let's say, and somebody offers them food for a fee, the person who is offering them food for a fee is not guilty of trying to make them starve. It's not guilty of putting them into into negative straits. It's offer it's offering them uh, a way to alleviate their position. And and, the, and this is true the, with the offering of any good or any service, including indentured servitude. Now, indentured servitude is not a case of somebody who um, is just everything is fine. They think they're doing great, and then they just um, are abducted and forced to become an indentured servant. That's not how it ever really worked. Um, we would call it slavery if it didn't work that way, or how uh, libertarians think it should work or would work. Uh, if you have somebody who suddenly finds themselves in really dire straits uh, for whatever reason, and again, it could be a reason of their own making or the, the making of somebody else or not even somebody, something else. If, if, if they're in dire straits because of the wrongdoing of another person, then they have a tort. They have a legal, they have liability concerns. They can go to that person and sue them and, and get restitution from whoever's actually responsible for putting them in that position. But people are going to be put in that position by agents that are not responsible, that are not liable, you know, mother nature, fate, chance, themselves, right? I mean, people are very often, most poverty comes directly from the actions of the of the impoverished. Not all, there certainly are worthy poor people who have done nothing wrong, and they've ended up in that situation through no fault of their own. But you can't characterize all poverty or all desperation as arising from that. Many people are desperate or poor or both from their own actions. And in such cases, you can't blame people who offer them a possible way out, who offer them the opportunity to, say, work to earn some money. Uh, you're, the boss who offers you, the employer who offers you a wage, offers offers you a trade of, of your labor for, for, for remuneration, whether it's financial or unkind, they're not the ones who put you in a bad position. They're offering you a lifeline. And it, at, at worst, that's morally neutral. I think you'd be actually more fair to, fair to say they're giving you an option that's actually good. The person who offers you something that you need, they are, if anything, morally good, not morally bad. Um, so now we can look historically and we can say, well, look at all, the, anyone can go on the internet and find all these stories of, uh, you know, in the case of the United States, this is most mostly going to be in the context of uh, poor people in Europe who can't immigrate, they can't afford to pay for their passage. They can't uh, make the trip themselves, but they would like to make the trip for whatever reason. And so they make an agreement that they will work for somebody for so many years. Okay, that's a voluntary exchange. They want to move. They want to get whatever the person who is in, they're becoming indentured to is giving them. That's not that horrible. Uh, and once they get here, uh, they can work it off and then they can, they, they've, uh, live by their contract and they'll be set free. Now you can find all these stories of say uh, owner, not not owners, but um, the the employer, for lack of a better term, I don't know if there's actually a term for the person who holds the legal, uh, who, who they become obligated to, the obligee A. Um, we can find stories of them doing things like maybe beating them, treating them really bad, restricting their uh, rights in other ways and, and you know that's all terrible but the thing is you have to remember that everybody was doing that that was not some specific thing uh, exclusive to indentured servants um, municipalities were doing that for crimes right the in Massachusetts Bay and most of the colonies there were all kinds of punitive punishments for all kinds of petty non victimless crimes uh, obviously Slaves were treated that way and worse. Family members were treated that way and worse. We can spend you can spend the rest of the day reading about uh, colonial era and even post colonial era families beating their children, uh, treating them what we in ways that we consider most certainly abusive, and yet also for their indentured service. Not all the time, but sometimes. So there's this total shift in context, and you can and you, you could condemn everything if there was a a a workers' commune. Uh, that existed in in 
say 1670, uh, there is no way the practices of those of that collect commune would be considered okay today. Uh, if you were to look at New Harmony or any of these other ones that came about in the 19th century, they had practices that you would find terrible. Um, and so you can't pin it to indentured servitude per se. Um, and again, there's another distinction here because, and there was a finer point here that Burgess alluded to, but didn't make explicit. And that is the idea that like, well, Hey, you can't say taxation is theft because in a libertarian world, you are still going to have enforcement of property rights. And he kind of went into this with the, the tr no trespassing sign. Like you're still going to make quote unquote, make in some way people who violate property rights, whether through theft or by breach of contract, which is what somebody who, you know, breaks a indentured servitude contract would be doing, you know, you, so you still have force, private property is force, private property is, is aggression, blah, blah, blah. So they didn't really get into that too explicitly. And I think that uh, this can be pretty easily debunked. Um, there is an enormous difference between two people. Uh, there's an enormous ethical and utilitarian difference between two parties making an agreement, getting into a, a, a mutually beneficial arrangement, at least as they both see it. And then one of the parties defaulting for some reason, breaching the contract, and then the the injured party uh, going against the tort uh, the, the tort feeser, the person who's broken the contract and demanding restitution. Uh, now, I think in my ideal society, this is going to be handled by arbitration and by insurance companies and by prearranged agreements on what to do if there's a dispute. You know, I think that. Uh, Burgess's uh, uh, condemnation of indentured servitude kind of doesn't make a lot of sense because you know you right now you can contract for work and nobody thinks that if you get a schedule from your job that says you have to be there you know uh, from nine to five five days a week that if you don't go one of those days or you skip a couple times that you are going to be thrown in prison uh, you're just likely going to lose your job and maybe not even that and that's fine. And so you can't pretend like if you violate any kind of agreement, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to ha have your head smashed in, which is what could happen if you don't pay your taxes. Uh, so uh, there's, there's that and there's, but, but that, but even acknowledging that, well, in most cases, people are going to work this out um, in, in, in a civil way through, through a, a legal system. There is still the, the idea that at the end of the day in a private property system, if say say you, you owe somebody money, you refuse to pay, it's contracted, it goes to court, you get, you, the, we go to arbitration, you get assessed a, you know, a, a penalty and you refuse, you refuse, you refuse, you refuse, you refuse. Now, ostracizing legal penalties, you know, boycotts, all, all this stuff can really twist someone's arm to where you're only going to be talking about marginal actors who, who resist, but you will still have some. What can be done then? And I think that it is justified in those cases when somebody has been dutifully convicted in a fair arbitration process where the plaintiff and the arb <laughs> where the arbiter is not in the same institution as the uh, parties seeking damages, right? It, it is not fair if uh, you have a dispute with Walmart and Walmart court decides, you know, who's guilty and who's not guilty. And it is not fair if you have a dispute with the government that the government gets to run the trial and, you know, do all that. So uh, there's that. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I do think it would be acceptable morally for the people that you have wronged uh, to take restitution from you. And that's something that they didn't really get into, but it should be more, it should be all about restitution and not about punishment. The punishment is an, is, is antecedent or, or, or derivative of the restitution. And what does that look like? Well, it could, it could just be confiscation of, of any goods that you have that are, 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 you know, of comparable value or sufficient value to pay back whatever you owe. And if you can't do that or you won't do that, the other thing would be to garnish your wages or say, hey, okay, you work and we're going to take, you know, whatever whatever we need, you know, payment plans, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of ways that could work. You don't have to go into the details. But I think at the end of the day, it wouldn't be wrong if somebody consistently refused and they had been found guilty of, 
of having violated this contract that, yeah, they might be imprisoned, uh, but not like in a prison where they sit around and do nothing, but something where they would work to pay back the debt. And I think that is a controversial idea among some libertarians, but I don't think it's the same ethically as what is, the government is doing because the government is just arbitrarily saying we own everybody. Everybody has uh, agreed. Everyone has consented to whatever decrees we make, whatever new law is passed, whatever new regulation is passed, uh, even undemocratically, whatever, whatever fiat that they propose, everybody in the geographical area that they claim to rule and around the entire world, because the United States has no problem and no compunction about imposing its, legis its legislation, its laws, its codes, its vengeance, its malice around the entire world, as we just recently saw with Julian Assange, as we see with these drone strikes, as we see with these uh, these aggressive wars that have, aren't even declared, but they go and they, they feel no problem fucking drone striking people in other countries according to our laws or not even according to our laws. In fact, in, in direct contravention of our laws in some, in some cases, in many cases, uh, and I think that the victims of that, the people who are held accountable to that, the people who are forced to, who are, are said to have consented to that, they have not consented at all, in my opinion. But even if you want to say that there is some level of consent in the sense that you haven't fled the United States, you haven't uh, actively led a rebellion that has successfully overthrown its power, um, and therefore you've consented, that level of consent is much, much, much more tenuous, and I would say tenuous to the point of non-existent, compared to somebody who agrees to do a job, signs a contract, has an agreement, it's an explicit agreement uh, with another person, and then violates that agreement. That is very different, okay? The social contract is a nebulous uh, thing. It doesn't have it's not something you can sign. It's not something that you can hold the government accountable to, right? You can't sue the government for failing to fulfill its side of the social contract. And this is these are totally different and totally absent um, from what would characterize the interactions of private individuals. Uh, so these are distinctions with a difference. I think that's a really important point to make out. Yes, there are differences, and there are differences that matter. Uh, you Anything that divorces somebody's uh, responsibility and actions from consequences is going to breed moral hazard. Uh, so, no, I don't think that private property or self-ownership is going to lead to any kind of really terrible situation. I think that um, having people be responsible for their actions is a good thing. If we're just going to say people are completely irresponsible for their actions, then they're, that, that totally changes everything, then you shouldn't be able to tax people because they're not responsible for anything and the taxers are not responsible for anything and everyone's just a completely incompetent moron who can't be trusted with anything, except for people in government and people. Yeah, I, mean, I guess if you're a professor at Rutgers, you rise above that. You are so, so capable that uh, you should have the right to do that. So um, it was an interesting debate. It was pretty clear that Burgess was uh, trying to avoid answering the questions and being as uh, uh, slippery as possible. I think he, I think he was more than smart enough to realize how he might get cornered on some of this. So he just kind of tried to rephrase the question. But I don't want to go over everything that he said. Just this point that, just because, I mean, we we can point. It's it's true that like in a private property situation, people can find themselves in desperate situations, and most of those situations are not necessarily the result of the fact that we have private property. And that's another important distinction to make. Um, if we have a private property anarcho-capitalist system and then there is a horrible earthquake and a lot of people die, that is not a repudiation of the private property order. You know, if a whole bunch of people become desperate and starving because there's a massive crop failure because of climate change. Uh, uh, and that's different. That's not a that's not a mark against an anarcho-capitalist order in the way any any more than if uh, thousands or millions of people die in an earthquake in a state, that's not necessarily the state's fault unless you fault unless we can show that one or the other society was negligent in some sense you know that they knew that they would be able to to prevent something and they didn't uh, that you know we and this is the more interesting thing like you, you we, we get into a debate it's too often in these debates especially if you're talking about anarcho-capitalism where the pro-state side will just kind of argue anarcho-capitalism is impossible therefore the state and this is just blatantly false. It's 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 entirely possible to have a society that doesn't have a state. 
It's been done many times. Most of human existence has been without states. States, when they first began, were quite isolated and quite limited in their extent and their scope and only very gradually spread. And they're spreading. Many people have a, have a big problem with this. They kind of assume, well, they're common now, therefore they must be beneficial. And that is just correlation does not equal causation. The fact that something is common or that is widespread is not an indication that it's beneficial for everybody. Okay, If this was true, then STDs and other diseases would be good things. Organized crime would be good things. Corruption would be good th a good thing. Um, you know, erroneous uh, I ideas, whether they be religious or economic or whatever, these are widespread. That doesn't make them, them true or beneficial, right? The fact that states have spread is not in itself evidence that they are necessary or that they're benevolent. I would be willing to, though, to say, well, we, need, we, do, we should explain why they've spread and we should be able to argue, uh, you know, from the, what we have of the empirical data, as imperfect as that is, and from principles and from theory. But, um, it's the better argument is that you have you can have a state and you can have an anarcho-capitalism system and which one is better which one is optimal what are the pros and cons to one or the other it's just stupid to say one is impossible and one is clearly possible yes states are clearly possible anarchy is clearly possible which one is better and the more sophisticated argument for those who want to publish books about making sophisticated arguments about debating leftists about right-wingers debating with left-wingers like Burgess purports to be needs to say okay which one is on net going to be better uh, and this is a very very difficult debate to have and a very uh, there the, it's very hard to be certain when we're talking about social science and all that so it's much easier just to say well it's impossible it'll never work or to use kind of demagogic rhetoric and say well I could the worst case scenario I can imagine is indentured servitude in, in a self-ownership society never mind that I can't prove that there's such a thing as collective ownership let alone state ownership you know therefore I want to avoid uh, indentured servitude so we'll have government control of everything of all property including a person's apparently since we're questioning whether there's ownership in self uh, and yet we could turn that around so easily and say, well, what's the worst thing that can happen if you have an institution, a state, whether it's democratic or socialist or not, monarchical, fascist, Republican, it doesn't matter, uh, that has the legal authority to assess, attack, take whatever it wants from anybody at any time. Uh, what's the worst that can happen there? And the worst that can happen there, um, I mean, there's just no comparison with that in indentured servitude, none at all. Um, you're talking about potentially killing hundreds of millions of people, enslaving everybody, not not just the the most desperate, you know, the the most unfortunate uh, subset of the population that, for whatever set of circumstances, finds themselves, you know, in in such a need that they would, you know, be willing and, and find it find it beneficial to sign uh, an indentured servitude contract for seven years or eight years or whatever it is, um, like. Yeah, that's maybe not what you and I would think of as ideal, but nothing is ideal. You know, at the end of the day, and this is something Rothbard and many others have pointed out, at the end of the day, like, people do have to work to avoid death. Uh, you know, we need to convert resources into goods that we can use at the most fundamental level into clean water and food, but on, on top of that, into shelter, into other things to enrich our lives. We need to do that, and if you don't do that, it's possible for occasional individuals to not do that. You can have indigent people who don't do anything and are still going to be supported. But that can't be done systematically by everybody. Somebody's going to have to work. This, All this, you have to work for a boss or starve. What's the proposal here? Then in democratic socialism, you won't have to do that? And they'll say, oh, no, we'll have welfare. You'll be guaranteed an income. You'll be guaranteed whatever your needs are. And they, there's a whole slippery slope there of how many needs are there, what's defined as needs. People think it's simple and it's really not because it's when you drill down, People have a thousand different answers, a million different answers to what people quote unquote need. But uh, what if it, what if you say, oh, well, no one has to work and everyone can just do whatever they want and they will get whatever they need, quote unquote need. Uh, so what happens when too many people stop working and all of a sudden there is nothing or the standard of living to everyone starts to slip because so many people are not working at all or very little. So what's the huge ethical difference between the claim of work for a boss or starve or work for the collective and starve they're both going to happen at the same time you can't have a collective that just says hey everybody can do whatever they want uh they don't have to work we'll just 
we'll just give you what you want. This is not how any of the collective, if the kibbutzim in Israel, the New Harmonies, all of these um, utopian socialist communist experiments, none of them just allowed everyone to do whatever they wanted. Uh, and most of them have big problems with members who, who who shirk, who don't work as much as the others want, and it causes a lower standard of living. And they will kick those people out or they'll punish them in some other way. And so there is, I mean, and there's other ethical reasons why the distinctions are worth, worse. Uh, these A voluntary communal situation is different. You can choose to join it. You can choose to leave it. So maybe it's stupid management style, and maybe they have big economic problems, but they're not ethically burdened with the fact that they're forcing everybody to partake. Uh, democratic states don't have that out. They are forcing everybody, whether they believe in anarcho-syndicalism or communism or not, to take part in, in the system and restricting their options to do anything else. Um, so, and, and as we can see, if people really don't like it and they start to leave, they'll restrict their ability to leave and build a wall with barbed wire and dogs and guns and they will stop people from stealing themselves and running away to some place where they have some some measure more of personal autonomy with some some measure more of, of ownership in themselves and in the fruits of their labor uh, so interesting debate definitely worth watching uh, I think it was kind of funny to find somebody who thinks of himself as being a sophisticated uh, person on the left who is going to give leftists good arguments to you know to argue against I don't know if it's specific libertarians or conservatives or both and then just trots out the most cliched banal uh, talking points that we've always heard and if you are a libertarian or an anarcho capitalist you were familiar with those talking points before you ever were a libertarian or or a or an anarchist especially and you became a libertarian or an anarchist over the years because you found good answers to those questions and that's how you got where you are. That's how I got where I was. I wasn't raised by an anarcho-capitalist. I wasn't school. I didn't go to Mises University. I didn't have Hoppe as a teacher or Tom Woods as a teacher. I went to a public school. That I was taught that the government, the, 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 the progression of history is the state becoming more powerful and more beneficial and spreading its wisdom across the world and that the United States is the greatest country that ever lived and the government is enlightened and basically is not perfect but it's the best thing that there is by a wide margin and that we sh should all be grateful for it and that's what my family thought and that's what everyone I knew thought and it was just a very very gradual process in my case of reading history and seeing that many of the claims made by the proponents of government and statism are false they don't make sense if you really examine it, it doesn't the idea that states are there for the benefit of the people they rule is highly questionable by their actions. It's very clear that they are selfishly motivated, motivated individuals. That there's not a separate class of beneficent altruists who somehow manage to be in power. Uh, right? There might be people who are indeed altruists and benevolent. Those people don't run governments. They don't make it that far. They don't. Be, when you when you get elected, it's not like this democratic spirit imbibes you and transforms you into a Marvel superhero. Um, you know. Uh, so, yes, the, the, totally tangent there. But uh, taxation is theft by any definition of theft that we have. Uh, it is utilitarian and in terms of its utilitarian effect. Is uh, totally negative. It's it's taking resources away from people and putting it in the hands of government who will then spend it in what ways they think is best, which are always, always suboptimal and in many cases um, genocidally horrendous and criminal. So anyway, quick video today, relatively speaking, and I will talk to you all another time. Bye -bye.